to Elevings Monthly Connect. As you know, these sessions were created to spark action and connect Elevings ecosystem. We are joined by a live audience and we create an opportunity for them to ask questions to our expert joining us today. The topic of today's episode is unlearning ancestral beliefs holding Latinas back. So this is a very timely topic, especially during this month where we're celebrating uh, International Women's Month. For today's session, we're honored to welcome an expert in this topic and an author, Valeria Aloe. Valeria is a Hispanic market and mindset thought leader, keynote speaker, and author. She is the creator of a bilingual mindset transformation platform for Hispanic and other professionals and entrepreneurs of color who are first generation to academic and professional spaces. Before launching her business, she worked more than 20 years in business development, marketing, and finance in leading companies across seven countries, including Procter & Gamble, Citibank, and PricewaterhouseCoopers, amongst others. Valeria is the author of Uncolonized Latinas, a book that keeps a deep dive into Hispanic cultural limiting beliefs that are at the root cause of the Latino leadership and wealth gap. She holds a degree in business administration and finance from Universidad Católica Argentina, an MBA from the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth, and a master in spiritual sciences. She currently serves as a board member of Latina Search National and Lupe Fund, advocating for Latina education and wealth creation. Valeria, it's an honor for me to have you here. Uh, we had the opportunity to meet a few years ago, and since I met you, there has been nothing but great conversation. I'm always inspired by all the work that you've done, especially with creating programs for the underserved community and for your generosity with your time and your knowledge. So thank you so much for, for being here. And what's most important for us is to get to know you from a personal perspective. So I just wanted to open it up so that you can tell us about yourself. Tell us a little bit more about your background, filling those gaps of what your bio didn't tell us. And then also in your book and the chapter in your book, you share a journey of how you got here, the moment in that when something changed in your life. So if you can just share a little bit with the audience, um, so that we can get to know you better. Excellent. Thank you, Claudia, for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And as you read in my bio, I'm from Argentina. I was born in a small town. I am the first generation in my family to attend college. So, you know, my father could not attend high school. He had to work. My mom did go to high school, but that was it for a woman in, in rural Argentina back then. And so from a very young age, they had no idea how they were going to pay for my education, but they always said, you are going to go to college. And I really embraced that. And I believe that. So I moved to Buenos Aires when I was 18. I started to work while attending, attending college to pay for my education. So it was a lot of uh, moving to the big city and working really hard. Started my corporate career, first one in my family to do so. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know how to dress for a corporate job. So it was a lot of learning. And I just remember that even when I moved to college, I didn't know how to cross the streets with traffic lights. So to that point, okay, I had no idea. So red, green, what's that? Okay, I didn't have any traffic lights in my hometown. So everything was a learning experience. And as a first generation into those spaces, you know, I felt uncomfortable, but I pushed through. In 2002, my husband and I had been married for only one year. Argentina, I'm not sure if you know, but in 2001, entered a major crisis. So we had, you know, opportunities to work abroad, but we said, why don't we go and do an MBA? And we applied to a few schools, we were accepted. I had no idea what an Ivy League was things like that that I didn't know and no one around that, around us knew, knew anything. So we had to figure things out all the time. So again, coming here to the US, that was a major change, cultural shock, I would say. And I used to hang out only with people who spoke Spanish. I can see now looking back how much I missed out. I, I can see that. And then I, I changed a lot of things, right, based on that. But always pushing through and always adrenaline and always what's next. 
until in 2016 and you know may, many years in corporate america successful careers i have two children who are now teenagers in 2016 i burnt out so the reason why i'm here sharing my story is because it looks like a story of success in which yeah you know access to education no one had in my family like how can I explain to my father what an MBA from an Ivy League is? He did not go to high school. We do not even speak the same language. You know what I mean? I wrote this book on colonized Latinas in English. My parents cannot read it because they do not speak a word in English. So things like that. And always pushing through and always, you know, what's next? And my world with all these degrees and all these corporate jobs, but very unhappy. So 2016 comes and that's to me the, the, the turning point in my entire life that I had put all my effort, all my life, all many decades in a corporate career, in, in my education and in a corporate career, and I was very imbalanced. Life is not just about, you know, studying and work. Those are key pillars, of course, for moving forward, but there is more than that. And that's how in 2016, and we can talk a little bit about, more about that, that's when I went into a dark hole, I would say, and I had to evaluate my life from scratch and really listen within to what is it that I really want and what makes me happy because I had built my entire life in making others happy and not myself. Wow. And, and I think what you're telling us, it's not necessarily something that some of us may not have experienced, right? And for those that are younger, we want them to hear this story so that they don't get to that point where they're so burned out that they get into that black hole. It's, it's about really connecting with our essence and continue to learn who we are. And like you said, what is our true mission and how are we going to keep that cup filled and full, right? So that we can continue to give instead of continuously empty because we have given so much. So thank you yeah. for sharing that. It, I know it, it's it's vulnerable, it's, it's personal, but at the same time it's real and it happens to us, especially um, underrepresented women in uh, corporate America. So thank you for sharing that. So tell us about your book. So first of all, congratulations. I know I was one of the champions and ambassadors who signed up to purchase the book even before it was uh, launched. So congratulations. I do have my copy right here in front of me and my filter did not allow it to see it. But how did you select the topic of uncolonized Latinas? And one thing that I wanted to mention to, to the audience, because if they were not part of the process, you made sure that you heard from us. You sent us pictures of how the front cover should look and we had the opportunity to vote on the selection yes and, you know so you made it interactive through the process so can you tell us how did you end up selecting the, the you know the name of the book yes so it all goes back to 2016 i have to say and that year i stepped out of my corporate career and i decided to take a break and i was invited to an event in the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And I suddenly see myself surrounded by Latinos for the first time. It was an experience of a, a full immersion. So things, you know, relationships and new people that I got to, to meet there, I ended up being the director for the entrepreneurial platform at the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce for three years. And that was a deep, deep immersion into the hurdles of our community, the needs, the systemic bias, the difficulties that both, you know, professionals and business owners face. And I saw myself represented in that. So I saw that all my struggle, all my struggles as an immigrant, as a Latina woman, um, I saw that reflected in people around me. And I had not been in that situation before because in a corporate career, I was mostly the only Latina in the room, generally. But then when I saw that we all go through the same, I started to get curious and I had to do presentations for the chamber, right? To, for the sponsors and so on. And in those presentations, I started to do research. So I started to pull data and I really learned that we are so important for the US economy. We are such a huge, powerful group. And I'm not even talking about the future. The future it looks brighter. We're going to be 30% of this country in 2060. We are now 20%. If we were our own country, we would be like Latinos in the US, would be the eighth largest economy on the planet out of 196 planets. So we are huge. And then we, I found we are disempowered. It's like we don't believe in ourselves. And in a way we hold ourselves back. And I saw that and I saw the self-doubt. I saw the lack of 
um, information. I saw the lack of sharing what works and also sharing, you know, that we go through the same pain so that we can feel more comforted that you are not the only one, right? So I saw all of that. And that gave me the idea of doing workshops on this topic. Long story short, COVID came, I did some workshops and they really resonated. So workshops on transforming our mindsets. That's what the book is about. And then I said, how can I make this something that is not my time because I have my teenagers, my husband, you know, everything, my clients. So that's when I decided to write a book. And when I went into deep research and I interviewed 55 Latinas, read 80 research reports. So the book has a lot of emotional stories from Latinas from all over, immigrants, the rest of immigrants, different age groups, different racial ethnicities. So when I went into that deep research that has these emotional stories, as I said, but also the data, I really learned that what we're going through is part of the, the roots of our Latin American countries. And the fact that we are colonized countries and we need to put the words out there. We were colonized, right? And we never talk about it. And because at least, you know, I was told and many Latinas I spoke to were told that we were born in third world countries. When you come to the US, the first world economy, you feel small. You're like, what am I going to contribute to the first world economy if I come from poverty, struggle, lack of resources, right? And that mindset of inadequacy in a way or inferiority gets passed from generation to generation. So through the research that I did, I saw that there is this trend in our culture of feeling small, of being serving more than leading, of being afraid of speaking up because we don't want to rock the boat, of not asking for what we need. And we put our heads down and work really hard, but we do not ask for what we need. So we burn out, we overcompensate, there is a lot there. So that's why the name came. And colonized Latinas means breaking the chains of all that ancestral mindset that we carry from our cultures. Because our cultures have beautiful things. Our cultures are amazing. And this country, the US is richer because we bring to the table everything that our culture has. Passion, creativity, uh, community, caring, nurturing, family, all of that. That's extremely important, but we also carry ancestral limiting beliefs that we really need to be aware of so we can unlearn them. So that's how that, that name in a very long story came up. <laughs> thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, in one of your chapters of the book, you talk about Latinas feeling guilty of success. What, what can you share about that? And I mean, if you could provide us one or two tips on how we can overcome that or change, transform our mindset to let go of that belief. So that one is one of the deepest one is shame or guilt, right? And when you come from a culture of scarcity, scarcity mindset or a culture of struggle and you start doing well. So most of us first generation who go to college and then we have access to professional spaces, we start doing well. That's the beauty of the US. If you put the work into it, right? And always remember to ask for what you need, including salary increases always. But if you put the work into it and if you get educated, you make progress and you start getting access to spaces and to higher salaries. But when you look around you, even in your family, you see that that's not the case for others. So in a way, there are many layers to that. But culturally, going deep, 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 deep to where this comes from is unworthiness, is the not deserving. So when you feel unworthy, or you feel that something is not yours, that you don't deserve it, even though you work hard for it, you, you don't feel that you deserve that, you start feeling guilty. And the guilt is an opening to negativity. So you start to overcompensate. And what I did as an example of my personal experience is when I started to make more money and started to get promoted, I started to work harder because I, unconsciously was trying to prove that they made the right decision choosing me for the position or promoting me or giving more money. So that's a really huge trap for us, first generation into, into corporate careers, to overcompensate, to feel better or feel less guilty or feel less uncomfortable with these spaces that we're stepping into, particularly when we're the only Latinas in the room. The clash, internal clash is even stronger. 
So that's something to be aware of. It's all about being aware and experiencing the feeling, but also taking action to move away from that, you know? Yes, thank, thank you for bringing that perspective because it's, you know, that overcompensation, you know, it puts so much, we put so much pressure on us. No one is asking yes. for that, right? It's an internal, our ego, our, our insecurities overcompensate and that's when we get into the cycle that while we're still being successful, as we get promoted, we continue to ask more and more of ourselves. So it's like the never ending cycle. Yes. So talk, right. So talking a little bit about um, love, because you also mentioned love as part of our healing process. Yes. And, and enable enabler to continue to move forward. I am very interested because I, I want to hear like what you are what your research says or what you find out about love and, and the healing process. And I'm assuming it's within this whole context of, you know, the burnout, overcompensation and, and feeling of, of shame. Yes. Yeah, so when I was doing the research and I was unraveling the full thing, I was also going through my own personal process of healing after 2016 and reconnecting with my essence and what's important to me. And I discovered by going through my own experience and talking to all these Latinas, it's 55 Latinas and more that I've been actually hundreds of Latinas that I've been working with since I stepped into these entrepreneurial spaces and professional spaces through workshops and so on for corporations, is that most of us are type A. Honestly, there is one good thing here. We do care. We do care. So we work hard because we want to do to, to make an impact. We want to have a legacy. So we care. But we go to the extreme, as we said before, of putting too much pressure on us. So how do you go to the center? What's the one point, you know, when you want to make a huge impact in your life and you're looking for making big changes in your life, you need to find that point that when you push that one button, that creates the most impact. So in my research, I found that the one button that creates the most impact is the self-love. Because if you love yourself, you are going to set boundaries. If you, are, if you love yourself, you're going to listen to what you need. You're going to respect what you need. If you need to go to bed earlier, if you need to take a break, you're going to honor that, right? If you love yourself, you're going to self-advocate. You're going to go out in the world empowered in a way protecting who you are, right? Like, and I'm not saying being defensive. This is like honoring the person that you are, but also setting boundaries and asking, self-advocating. So when you love yourself, you're not going to accept to make 50% less on the market value. We know the statistics show that Latinas make 50% of what a white man makes. If you love yourself, you won't accept that. A person who loves herself goes out into the world only going after opportunities that are aligned with her values, asking for the money she deserves, taking breaks without feeling guilty. So self-love is the core and the one point that will create the maximum change in your life. So how do I do you achieve self-love? In my personal experiences, when you love somebody, you want to spend time with that person. You want to get to know that person. So there are many ways to get you to know yourself, particularly for me, journaling is a big one, spending time in nature, listening to soft music or meditation, something that quiets my mind, the chattering of the mind that we have, and that creates that pause in which I can connect with my essence. And that moment of peace that I connect, you feel it. It's a feeling more than anything, right? So create more of those spaces and those opportunities and really tune in with what you want. Listen to yourself. That to me will change my life entirely. The moment that I stopped chasing people or trying to make others happy, and I gave myself the grace of, I'm gonna take half an hour and I'm going to do a meditation or go for a walk in silence. You know, that those little things really changed my life entirely. And when I started to get to know who I am and I looked back into my past and I saw all the work that I put and I started to respect myself for that. I said, oh my gosh, look at all, I started to feel proud, right? So it's, it's a transformation process that is internal, but that we give you huge um, changes in the outer world. You will start seeing different results. Thank you. I have a red box that I have been carrying with me for many years. And in that box, I have thank you cards that 
employees, mentees, people that I've helped in the past have, have written to me. And whenever I'm feeling doubtful of my abilities to do something, when I'm feeling down, I just have to open that red box and read a few of those cards to get re-energized. Like you said, just looking back and knowing that I had been able to make an impact in someone else's life provides me with the feeling and, and you know, chips my mindset on the right things. But we all need to have some sort of a form to be, right? I mean, we know what our triggers are and what the solutions we need to find. So that red box has been, and I love when I see it, that it's like 19 years ago, I got this card and I'm still saving it because it meant so much at that point. So um, yeah. so thank you for, for sharing your rituals about, you know, meditation, the walk in nature and, you know, and taking that time. So as we get to our last question, um, what are uh, we like to leave the sessions with actionable items? And I think you already provided a few, but what are three to five things that anyone who's listening to this podcast, whether it's you know shortly after it's released or long time from when it's released, what are things that they can do uh, if they want to transform their mindset and rise together amongst other women? What are your you know your your pieces of advice on that? So number one is to take time for yourself, as we said. We need to just stop. And it's not a time to look into the phone or to do anything. It's to stop, to really do whatever works for you, to connect with you, even if it's five to 10 minutes a day, even if it's at the end of the day when you're about to fall asleep, but have that time with you. Feel, I would say, the intimacy of being with you, you know, with your own soul. So have that time. That's extremely important. and. I would love to have even more windows of time to do that maybe 10 times a day, but only one or two makes a difference daily. So that's one. Number two, to be more aware of the way you talk to yourself. We are too hard with ourselves. And I believe now we have the opportunity to have the awareness and to listen to the way we talk to ourselves. And I love, I love how one of the women that interviewed for my book, her name is Monica, in her words, she said, I'm mothering myself. So she's talking to herself with compassion. She's forgiving with herself. You know, she's um, talking to herself in a way that is um, nurturing, caring, um, expansive, but not judgmental, not harsh, right? As we usually do, particularly as Latinas, who are first generation into those spaces. The first thing we do is feel that we, there is something wrong with us and we start being harsh with ourselves. Number three, I would say, we have the opportunity as Latinas, and to your point, Claudia, of how do we all rise together, is to look around and learn from others. And what I look around right now is to, I, I really observe what other people do. And I capture that in my book as well. I, I saw this woman that had an amazing, Elisa, Elisa is her name. She has an amazing network. So I sat with her and I told her, I asked her, how did you build your network? Can you help me? to understand, you know, understand, give me the insights on how do you build a powerful network? Another person had a, a shy, an amazing uh, personal brand. I said, how do you build your personal brand? So we need to, uh, even outside our Latino community, look at how people ask for salary increases, how they talk about their victories, how they, they sell themselves in a corporate world, they position their own personal brand and really start learning from them super important so as i said the the first steps were more about taking time work on your mindset i'm moving now into outer assertive action so changing your mindset being aware of your thoughts mothering yourself extremely important self-love extremely important but also the outer action and taking assertive action has to go with it so the fourth one i would say and i mentioned a little bit about that is building your network as Latinas, we have to, if we want to grow and have an impact, we have to learn to relate to all types of people, even those with whom we feel uncomfortable. We need to learn to have a relationship. And I'm thinking about another woman who I interviewed and she said, I had to learn and train myself on how to have good relationship with white men that were leaders in the company. And it's not just talking about work. Sometimes it's about talking about family or what you do outside of work or which other interests you have. So that's extremely important. Build a network with particularly focusing on people who, you know, have access to spaces we don't have and who intimidate you. You know, take that risk, step out of the comfort zone. And the last one that I will offer is be very intentional about building your personal brand. 
Talk about your victories. Uh, this Latina leader that I interviewed, she told me that she sets her calendar in her calendar 25% of her time per week to talk about the great work she does and her team does, and that has paid off significantly. She also talks about the hurdles she, the hurdles she faces, so she gets ideas from the rest of the company and people know what she's working on. So all the time, like she's communicating out there what she's doing, and that has really helped her career and that of her team. So those are some of the ideas that I can offer really quickly. Thank you. I, I really like the, the last one because I think um, Dr. Feliciano and other people have mentioned this, and it's really about owning our own narrative, right? So we can mm. spend a lot of time working, but if we're not sharing the success, if we're not quantifying the impact that we're having, if we don't feel comfortable owning our narrative to be able to get that spotlight and that visibility that we need, no one is really going to do it for us, right? So owning our careers, <laughs> owning our voices, and owning our narrative, it's extremely important amongst everything else that, that you mentioned. But yes. I think that's a really good one because it doesn't come natural. It has exactly. to be a very deliberate, actionable plan. So thank you. That's a good exactly. one. Exactly. And you know, Claudia, why it, why it doesn't come natural? Because our culture taught us to be quiet. Calladita te ves más bonita. Or, oh, that's showing off. So for us women, look at women in Latin America, right? We were influenced to serve, to be behind the man. We have to say these things, but those of us here are the ones breaking through those spaces and you know breaking those chains and it's extremely uncomfortable but we have the opportunity and it's doable we only have to do it practice 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 keep on doing it but we need to recognize that it is okay to be uncomfortable and that is because of the cultural influence we have in our unconscious and that we are unlearning that as we go so it's completely normal to feel that is something that we don't master yet you know we're in the process yes. and also to validate each other right if we're on the same space to say to piggyback on what valeria said so i'm validating your point and i'm adding more and now we yes. don't have a voice so it's so important to come together as, as not only as latina woman just as woman in general as we are facing this so Yes. Thank you so much. This has been extremely valuable and, you know, really fun to have you here. So, but we want to make sure that people know where to find you, where to follow you. If they want to get your book, where can they buy your book? Which, by the way, we're giving one of our books away that she will be able to autograph and send directly to the winner. Uh, I did put in the chat the um, uncolonizedlatinas.com information, but uh, please share with us where could they find you if they wanted to follow you. So in addition to the website uncolonizedlatinas.com, I'm very active in social media. I would say LinkedIn, big one, and also Instagram, and the handle is Valeria Aloe. 